So today we're going to talk about what I, I advertised on last Thursday as the backstory behind the South African transition, or at least part of the backstory that involved business. And this is the first of several classes in the second half of the course where we're going to turn the lights up on business. We talked a lot about the declining fortunes of labor in this course and how that's played out in politics. But we haven't spent much time on business, just generally treating it as a black box. Obviously, the power, uh, relative power of business has increased uh, in the capitalist world since the collapse of communism, and that's brought new dynamics. It also, as a normative matter, tends, when, when capitalism is the only game in town, it tends to make the old Marxist critiques of capitalism a little beside the point. Uh, and the more interesting questions about business and capital are what are the conditions under which they play a progressive role in politics, what are the conditions under which they play a predatory role in politics, and, and how might they be shifted uh, from a less predatory role of the sort we saw in Russia in particular, how might business be induced uh, to, to play more, more constructive roles in politics, even in very difficult politics. So that's one theme that's going to come back several times in the latter part of the course. But let's begin by going back to Johannesburg in the 1990s. All of a sudden, I saw the security uh, people running out, and uh, I said, what's up? And they said, the, they've broken through and they're coming. And then my own security man uh, simply grabbed hold of me and ran. Pandemonium just broke out in the entire building. Many people on the ANC side, from the government side, all huddled into the government offices. We thought the right-wingers would never dare just march into government offices and start accosting people or assaulting them. And in fact, we even feared that we would be shot at. The AWB overwhelmed the police who retreated before them. Signs of glass and everything shattering and everything and reports coming through that they are looking for us, particularly Rolf and Cyril. Terrified delegates barricaded themselves in their offices. In the conference chamber, the AWB chanted and daubed slogans demanding a separate white state. Soon after the invasion, the negotiators agreed that an election should be held the following April. With the ANC growing in confidence and looking certain to win the election, the National Party had retreated bit by bit on nearly all its power-sharing demands. As the conference wound up with the ANC triumphant, Ramaphosa celebrated his 41st birthday. I was able to see Ruf Mayer for the first time dancing uh, on the floor uh, where we were having this party. He was quite happy, he was quite uh, jovial. And I kept wondering whether I would have been as happy as he was if I was in his position, having finally given in in the way that they had. Key National Party negotiators were satisfied they had struck a workable deal with an adversary they had grown to trust. Now the election could proceed. Terra Blanche threw all his weight into stopping the election. He summoned a rally at the Pretoria Monument to the Africana pioneers. He said if Mandela wanted war, he would get war. Yes! 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 Terra Blanche then persuaded the Volksfront to boycott and oppose the election. Als is die bereid om in een verkiezing in te gaan, 
Maar die aard sê die boere sy kop en tel. Pretty frightening stuff, you might think. Um, and I, the reason I put it up there is just to emphasize that the, when, the, when Mandela and um, de Klerk negotiated uh, their agreement, that was not the end of the matter. It was, to, to quote a Churchillism, uh, it was the end of the beginning. And there was a lot that had to happen for the transition actually to be consummated. And it was enormously fragile. And I'm just going to walk you through a bit of a timeline to give you a sense of how fragile it was. We, we saw last Thursday uh, that on the 2nd of February, 1990, the government announced it was unilaterally uh, freeing all political prisoners, unbanning all organizations, and planning to negotiate with the ANC. Three months later, the ANC unilaterally suspended its armed struggle uh, and, and began serious negotiations. That led in December 1991 and then May of 1992 to two rounds of roundtable negotiations, the so-called CODESA, Conference on a Democratic South Africa Negotiations, where all of the stakeholders, there were 19 stakeholders initially, all the political parties, all social movements had a seat at the table uh, as a way of trying to negotiate the transition to democracy. As I said to you in the last lecture, a de democratic path to democracy is difficult because um, a democratic political order is a public good and it's very difficult to do that, to provide them democratically. And indeed, there were people um, and in groups that didn't want to see this transition. The far right uh, we've talked about, and we'll see today, other groups were not so interested in, in seeing this transition to a unified democratic South Africa. So they became spoilers, and they uh, perpetually interrupted the negotiations, stonewalled the settlement. Um, and in May of 1992, they were sort of reconstituted, having been floundering since the previous year. But um, a month later, there was a, a massacre at a place called Boipatong, which uh, where about 45 people were shot dead, apparently, uh, allegedly, by um, Zulu supporters of the Inkata Freedom Party, an ethnic, an ethnic separatist party that I'll tell you more about shortly. But it was widely believed that um, the, the South African security police were b behind the scenes involved in the Boipatong massacre. The result was CODESA collapsed, um, and uh, the violence escalated dramatically, and uh, so dramatically that the ANC and the government started having secret talks. But they weren't really secret. Everybody knew they were going on. I was in South Africa that year. Every day on the evening news, there would be reports of what had gone on in the secret talks between uh, the ANC and the government. Uh, and eventually, they signed a deal, an, an elite pact, if you like, uh, in September that was called a record of understanding uh, about how things would move forward. Uh, this then led them to create something called a multi-party negotiating forum. And in the multi-party negotiating forum, basically the ANC and the government told the other players what was going to happen to give them time to accommodate themselves and adjust. Um, but they did not really treat it anymore as a multi-party negotiation. As far as the government and the ANC was concerned, um, it was a done deal, and people had to get with the program, so to speak, uh, uh, or, or be left behind. In, later in that same month, um, a young, charismatic ANC member, on, and very much on the more radical flank of the ANC, was assassinated. Chris Hani, uh, very extremely charismatic, also in the Communist Party, and um, the result of this, he was, he was assassinated by a right, uh, I think it was Polish extraction, white South African. Um, and the, the, the whole country seemed to be on the verge of exploding. The violence escalated uh, hugely, and um, 
the, the talks were in danger again of, again of falling apart. And I put up on the slide there that the, the election date was set. And the reason for that was that, that Mandela and Ramaphosa uh, came to de Klerk eventually uh, and said that the, the only way they could tamp down the violence was if it was, it was a non-negotiably agreed that the election would take place within a year of Chris Harney's death. So that the election had to be held in April of 1994 became a, a hard deadline, if you like, a non-negotiable item, and that turned out to be important later. Um, realizing that, uh, that they had been handed a fait accompli, Boutalezi, who was the head of this uh, Inkata Freedom Party, uh, walked out of the, of the, um, of the talks. Uh, and essentially, the multi-party negotiating forum collapsed at that point. And true to the divided dollar story we've been talking about earlier in the course, he, even though he was the leader of the ethnic Zulu party, he joined forces with the right-wing Afrikaans whites uh, and, and um, also the heads of the traditional homelands, sort of Bantustans, who saw themselves as losing their power in the new South Africa, and they announced that they were going to be boycotting the elections. And that was important because most people who know a little bit about the South African conflict know the story behind this, this pie chart that, as you can see, the black African majority of the country was 79%, whites were fewer than 10%, and the rest were uh, mixed race or Indians and Asian groups. What, what, what is less well known outside of the South African context is the ethnic breakdown of the non-white population. And there you can see that Zulu were a plurality of 28%, eight, eight, but the next greatest group, uh, almost 20%, were the Kosa. And um, why this matters is that the Kosa were uh, more or less 100% 100 committed to the ANC. The ANC probably won, not 100%, but were over 90% of their vote. But the Zulu were deeply divided uh, nationally between the ANC and Inkata. But in the, in the eastern part of the country, which was then called Natal, today is called KwaZulu Natal, um, they, they, could, they controlled the majority of the, of the, of the Zulu vote, the, the Inkata Freedom Party. And so from Butalezi's point of view, um, a much better outcome would have been a partition at the end of the day of some sort where Inkata could be in a majority uh, and so actually control uh, what is today KwaZulu Natal. Uh, so he didn't really want a transition to a country in which all the polls told them that the ANC would win a two thirds overall national majority. And so uh, Butalezi here was not just even though we talk about the deal between the ANC and the government, uh, Butalezi was the potential spoiler of this settlement. And why did this matter? It mattered because a, this civil war in Natal would have made the transition impossible. The levels of violence by 1992 in KwaZulu-Natal had already reached civil war proportions. And the notion that the, the country could really have a successful election, which was boycotted by Inkata, was um, not credible. And so it was a huge problem going forward. So just going back to the timeline, um, in, in June 1993, one of the far right-wing groups torpedoed the negotiations yet again, similar to the clip I showed you, but a, a, di a different meeting in Kempton Park. They just drove armored vehicles through the plate glass windows and um, constantly were trying to upset and harass the negotiators. Um, all of the time, this election that had to occur in April of 1994, lest uh, the deal between the government and the ANC come unstuck, uh, 
uh, was approaching. And indeed, a month before the election in March, there, it all came to a head in one of the homelands. The homelands had been um, sometimes called Bantustans, as I said. These were the nominally independent states under, under apartheid's migrant labor system. Um, violence exploded when the leader of one of these said he was not participating in the election, and some of the right-wing Afrikaners went ostensibly to support him uh, in the hope that this would precipitate a military coup, that the military coup, military would get behind the, um, would get behind the uprising in Boputaswana, and uh, there would be a takeover, and the, and the uh, impending election would be uh, stamped out. And so uh, there were these people went there in, in paramilitary uniforms. A lot of people were killed, uh, including uh, four white Afrikaners were killed, and it was filmed on national television and shown over and over again. And it really seemed, this is now we're a month before the election, it seemed like the whole world was going up in smoke. If you, if you think about uh, April 1994, those of you who are uh, old enough to remember, this is when uh, the Rwandan genocide was in full swing uh, to the north. Um, these were the kinds of pictures that South Africans were seeing on television and in the newspapers every night. Um, and uh, so the, the idea that you, know, that you could have some horrific bloodbath, was, it wasn't an academic thought. It was going, you know, we're seeing it every night on the evening news. And just literally weeks before the election, three weeks before the election, this is what was happening in Johannesburg. Johannesburg, the commercial heart of South Africa, paralyzed by gunfire and fear. Chaos erupted on the streets as thousands of Zulu supporters of the Encarta Freedom Party protested against the election. The rattle of AK-47s echoed around the banks of the business district as security forces tried to keep control. Tear gas and stun grenades filled the normally quiet squares. There were running gun battles as police tried to force back gun-wielding demonstrators using rubber bullets and buckshot. At least eight people were killed by African National Congress guards when the Encarta crowds reportedly tried to attack the ANC headquarters. Bodies littered the streets as mayhem brought central Johannesburg to a standstill. So it didn't look like we were three weeks from a, a, a democratic national election. And uh, at that point, Henry Kissinger and Lord Carrington of Britain were brought in to try and mediate a solution. They spent all of two and a half days there, concluded the situation was hopeless, packed up, and left. Um, and so then again, the, the uh, newspapers were just full of uh, portent of failures. Uh, this is an article which you can peruse uh, at your leisure, but basically detailing the way in which uh, Zulu militias were preparing to escalate the civil war. And then, miraculously, we turn on the evening news and this is what we hear. In South Africa, a breakthrough may be imminent to stem recent political violence. Political leaders appear to have found a way to end the standoff over the country's first all-race elections. Another meeting is set for Tuesday to finalize the deal. CNN's Peter Arnett reports. Following six hours of talks in Pretoria aimed at ending a major political standoff in South Africa, the official line was guardedly optimistic. Our talks today have gone very well. So well, in fact, that sources tell CNN that details of a plan to bring the Zulus into the election have been okayed by negotiators for the government and for the Zulu chief. And a document has been drawn up that must now only be approved by ANC leader Nelson Mandela. And Mandela did approve uh, the document and uh, the election went forward. And uh, I, I caught it did indeed not boycott the election. Uh, and it occurred as planned on the 27th of April.
1994. The ANC won almost more than 62.5% of the vote. The National Party came in second, and Encarta uh, came in with 10.5% of the vote and enough votes uh, to get control of the regional legislature in the new KwaZulu-Natal, as well as three seats in the cabinet. And so uh, uh, that's the timeline up through the election. Today's agenda is to talk about business and the backstory. You can see there were, the, just from what I went through, there were many points at which this might have fallen apart. And business had a great deal to do with why it didn't. Um, and in the course of considering the role of business in this transition, we're going to uh, revisit some of our earlier uh, briefer and glancing visits with modernization theory and look at uh, what we, we should think about business's attitudes toward our authoritarian and democratic systems. And then um, we'll, we'll also, uh, part of our theme is to think about the role not only that business played during this crisis, but also before and after to get a more uh, panoramic historical sense. So, just to be clear as to what, I, what I'm saying and what I'm not saying, I'm, I'm not arguing, and it wouldn't be plausible to argue, that business caused the transition from apartheid in South Africa. Uh, ap apartheid was caused by many things, not least the negotiations we talked about uh, last time between leaders and not least the activities of the liberation movement. Business, however, did have a great deal to do with the fact that the transition was peaceful, substantially peaceful, and that it ended up in a democracy. That is to say, it is clear that apartheid's days were numbered. The, the, the status quo as it existed in South Africa in the 1980s was not going to survive. But that didn't mean you were going to re get, end up with a democracy. It could have, there could have been a military coup. There could have been an ongoing civil war. There could have been multiple other outcomes. There could have just been a massive crackdown of an apartheid authoritarian state. Um, but uh, so the role that business played was in facilitating a peaceful transition to a democracy rather than some other more bloody denouement. And I'm going to focus on four areas where business had an impact. The first is in getting negotiations started in the first place. By the time Mandela uh, in the late 1980s was secretly uh, talking to de Klerk, um, and messages. There, there had, various things had been actually been going on for some time uh, that made it propitious for those talks to begin. And I'll, I'll, I'll say something about that. Um, then I'm going to talk about the role business played in actually brokering the deals between the government and the ANC initially, and then uh, between the two of them and in Carter toward the end. Um, I'm going to talk about the role business played in managing potential spoilers. When, when I put that uh, stylized diagram up of transition negotiations last time, I mentioned that the, the people on the flanks uh, of, the, of the government and the opposition, potential spoilers, had to be convinced, co-opted, or marginalized if the, if the transition is not to be scuttled. And business played a role in that. And then I also mentioned that it's very important in the conversations about from above and from below to build support for the new dispensation, which does not have a constituency in the old order because it's a deeply polarized situation. Um, so those will be the four areas that we'll focus on. Now, let's go back to the 1970s. This is the you know, the National Party had come to power in 1948. It had spent much of the 1960s creating the apartheid order with um, compulsory uh, segregation, forcing forced removals of, of Africans from the cities into these homelands where they then worked as migrant laborers. Uh, and by the 1970s, um, the, it, was, the, it was 
firmly established. The government had been in power for more than a decade. There was no meaningful white opposition party, and they seemed to be entrenched. In a setting like that, why might business decide that it should start talking to the leadership of the liberation movement? Liberation movement was illegal, it was underground. After 1963, they were, many of them were, including Mandela, uh, were in prison, and Jacob Zuma. Others were like um, Mbeki were in exile in London or um, elsewhere in Eastern Europe. Why would business leaders, and now I'm talking about big business, uh, white big business, why would they want to start talking to the leadership of the liberation movement? Yeah. Thinking about like business people. You got it. Hi. No? Well, just yell. Okay. <laughs> like from a business perspective, 80% of the population, if you empower that, 80% of the population have a bigger market to sell. Okay, so business might have a bigger market. Uh, if, if they could do better business. And there was certainly a view uh, that apartheid was, was uh, produced inefficient labor markets and, and so on. We'll, we'll come back to that. Um, but we should, we should notice this is quite unusual. Typically in authoritarian systems, business does not get involved in politics. If we look at China, business, when we, we talked about the rule of law in China and so on, business might go to to court over business issues, but typically they keep their heads low in politics in authoritarian systems. You know, they, they may be interested in the market, but that doesn't mean you have to have a democracy to sell in the South African market. And indeed, uh, Carlos Bosch, who I put up on an earlier slide when we were talking about modernization theory, uh, his argument about his modern version of modernization theory um, if you go back and look at that slide, you'll see I had him on the slide which said monetization comes as a result of pressure from below. Uh, and so this might seem inconsistent with what I'm about to say now, but it's not. Because his, the way, he, and many people have made this argument, I'm just giving him as, as an illustration, is th the thought was that in an authoritarian setting, business is going to resist democratization um, until they think they're pretty sure they can leave. It's a Hirschman story. Um, so if, if I think I can't leave I, and I give everybody the vote, it's the, you know, the median voter problem. They're going to tax me. They're going to expropriate my assets once they have the votes. So I have a strong incentive to resist democratization. Um, but once I can, if I can leave with my capital and with my assets, then the threat of exit, my threat of exit, makes it less likely that they will be willing to risk the economy's future by taxing me. So this, so this variant of modernization, as I said, it, it assumes the pressure to democratize is coming from below, but the argument is business is going to line up with authoritarian systems so long as there's what economists refer to as high asset specificity. That is, you can't take it with you. Um, you know, if you've got, if, if it's a world revolving around human capital, I can just walk out of the door with my human capital in my cranium uh, and, set, you know, set up shop elsewhere. But if what I own is a gold mine, I can't take the gold mine with me, right? I can't take the diamond mines with me, right? And so this is why it seems counterintuitive, at least from the standpoint of those traditional theories, it seems counterintuitive that business would actually favor an opening to the liberation movement because they had very high asset specificity. They were, they were, big business was invested in, in big mining and the diamond mining and so on. They were also invested elsewhere in the, co the economy, but they didn't have much credible capacity to threaten exit. And so that's initially a puzzle and we'll come back to it, but it means that there must have been sticks and carrots there must have been sticks to make uh, business think that they needed 
to start talking, and there must have also been carrots to make it look appealing. And I want to start with the sticks. Sticks matter because things, if, if, um, if people don't have to change, they're probably not going to change, for the most part. Particularly, I said po most politicians are risk averse, um, and most business people also are, are, are risk averse in that sense. They might want to take business risks, um, but they're not going to get involved in trying to shape the political future unless they start to feel that the status quo is as what an economist would call a wasting asset, that things are changing uh, in ways that uh, are not likely to be good for them. So what, 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 could, what could the sticks have been? Yeah? There was boycotts. Sanctions. OK, so sanctions, the, the, the difficulty with sanctions, and this was the era of boycotts, this is disinvestment. Um, uh, David Swenson, who's managed the Yale Endowment since 1985, will tell you a story if you, if you have lunch with him, that he, he came to Yale from Wall Street in 1985, and he went to the investment office, and he found it occupied by anti-apartheid student demonstrators. And he said, right then I knew I'd left Wall Street. Um, <laughs> So uh, there, were, there, were, there were boycotts that were uh, passed over, uh, over Reagan's veto. The truth about sanctions is that they don't work, though. Industrial sanctions don't work, and in South Africa they didn't work because, you know, um, Kodak left, but Agfa came. Uh, Ford left, but Toyota came. And indeed, the sanctions led to stimulation of the, in, of the indigenous capital markets and the growth of the South African economy. So industrial sanctions didn't really uh, make any difference. Um, I'll come back to financial san sanctions in a bit. But, but a principal ca uh, stick here was that um, so South Africa had illegal black trade unions. They, were no, they had outlawed black trade unions under apartheid. And this hadn't mattered that much to business because there had been labor quiescence through the 1970s, as you can see from that slide. There had been almost no industrial action. In the early 1970s, that starts to change. And uh, although it's, it's child's play compared to what's coming later, as you can see, if you look at what ha happened in the 1980s, um, as, as, as compared with what they were used to, there were these big outbreaks of wildcat strikes, uh, and the mine owners didn't know who was running them, and they wanted to be able to negotiate with them. They wanted to be able to negotiate industrial peace, because they were trying to run the mine. So in the first instance, they wanted unions to be legalized so that they could have basically a corporatist arrangement where the management and labor could negotiate industrial deals and they could be enforced by the government. Um, the government was strongly opposed to this for the obvious reason that with all political opposition illegal, if you legalized unions, they would become magnets for political activism. The mine owners said, yes, we know that, but we should do this. We have to do this. We can't run the mines. And there was something of a, of a standoff for several years in the mid-1970s, but eventually the uh, business leaders beat the government into submission. Uh, and the, uh, something called the Vihan Commission was appointed that was nominally going to look at it, but it was run by a man, Vihan, who was an academic who was known to be a supporter of of legal trade unions for blacks. Anglo-American, the biggest multinational in South Africa and one of the biggest in the world at that time, actually had someone on the Vihan Commission. It recommended the legalization of trade unions and uh, they became indeed magnets for um, political activism. And many people criticized Anglo-American and, and big business for having supported this. But they, but they did it anyway. Uh, and and as a, from a point of view of the economy, uh, they, it, it worked for them. They did have to deal with very dramatic strikes later, 
but they did create uh, their South Africa. This is the development that first the National Mine Workers Union, then something called COSATU, uh, the uh, Conference of South African Trade Unions. One of the most powerful union movements in the world was finally created, and certainly one of the most powerful union movements in the world today. So uh, that turned out to be important. It also led to the development of relationships, personal relationships between business leaders and people who were widely represented in the liberation movement, uh, something that had not previously existed. I said that industrial sanctions didn't work. The same was not true of financial sanctions. Uh, uh, in the, in, uh, in the mid-1980s, amidst all the pressure, uh, eventually Chase and Citibank Bank refused to roll over South Africa's debt, um, and they couldn't pay it. And so there was a massive run on the banks and uh, huge capital outflows, and that that created a crisis in the financial sector that was not resolved. Um, what, the, what the leaders, and you can see this if you go on the case and look at the interview with Victor Sidney Frankel, now deceased, um, they responded to this by, by ha up running junkets of bringing business people to uh, the country to try and convince them that uh, South Africa was worth investing in, that they shouldn't leave, and they had set up meetings for them with government officials and took them around plants and so forth and weekends in Kruger National Park. Uh, and they also had them meet with leaders of the liberation movement, which the government didn't like, but they, they tolerated it. Um, it. It was a complete failure from the point of view of either stopping capital outflows or in bringing capital in. But again, it was a way in which leaders of the South African financial sector developed personal relationships with people in the liberation movement that would turn out to be later, uh, to be important later. Um, so uh, these, these relationships were built and it, they had the effect of breaking down the barriers, at least at the elite level, between the leaders of the liberation movement and the leaders of both the big mining companies and South Africa's uh, financial sector. What about carrots? Why, why might carrots matter? Carrots are important because even if people think the status quo is not an option anymore, they may nonetheless dig in their heels. So for instance, in, in the 1960s in, in, and 70s in um, Rhodesia, as it then was, um, the white farmers didn't see any good future. And so they dug in behind Ian Smith's government until the very end, until basically the British uh, pulled the plug on him. We're going to talk more about Israel-Palestine uh, in, in, in a few classes from now. But I can't tell you how many Israeli businessmen I have interviewed who say, the status quo is terrible, we hate it, it sucks, and the alternatives are all worse. <laughs> and they mean it, they believe that's how the world looks to them. So, you, so in addition to thinking that the status quo is bad, maybe even untenable, people have to be able to see a possible future that has some appeal, at least greater appeal than the status quo. And the important thing here was the collapse of communism. Because the leadership of the ANC and the leadership of the South African Communist Party had pretty much been the same people, the same actual individuals, people like Joe Slovo. And believe me, this was a not, these people were not like Euro communists in expensive Italian suits. Just to give you a sense of what kind of Communist Party it was, during that coup in Moscow, a failed coup in Moscow that I talked about in the, in the first class on the collapse of the Soviet Union. Those three days when Gorbachev was locked up in his dasha on the Black Sea, three communist parties in the world recognized the coup, one of which was the good old SACP. So these were hardline Stalinist communists and known to be such, widely known to be such. And, um, 
Uh, in fact, the, the leader of the South African Communist Party, Bram Fischer, had been a, an Afrikaner judge and the son of the state president and was uh, caught and horribly tortured uh, for the rest of his life in prison. So, you know, the gloves were off with the communists and people, and as far as white business elites were concerned, the big fear was that if you had a transition to majority rule, there would be communism, right? The, South, the, the ANC and the South African Communist Party were one and the same thing from their point of view. Once communism started to go off the table, that reality changed. As, um, as one As one uh, businessman I, I interviewed put it, he said, I woke up one day and I realized we do not have to be Cuba. We can be Brazil. And that, when, that, um, when that light bulb went off for him, it was um, an epiphany. Because they suddenly realized that there was a possible future for them uh, in a new order and uh, particularly once you see the status quo is collapsing, you um, want to get to a, a better future if once you can see uh, that possibility. So an important fact about South African business is that the ownership of the economy was highly concentrated at this time. Um, Mining had long been dominated by a small number of huge companies, Anglo-American and De Beers being the two most important. Just to give you a sense, in 1985, Anglo controlled more than half of the capitalization of the whole Jan Johannesburg Stop Exchange, and the top five corporate groups controlled 80% of it. Concentration in manufacturing had been increasing since the 70s, and by 80, 1985, the largest 5% uh, of firms contributed at least 50% of output. So uh, even though the South African economy is, is not an oil curse kind of a story, it was a pretty diversified economy, it was owned by a small number of large conglomerates. Mike Spicer, who is the general manager of Anglo that I interviewed uh, in one of those videos, which you can see in the case, he, sa he, ba he said, you could get nine people around a table, would have been nine men, you could get nine men around a table and you basically had the whole South African economy there. Um, so th this is just, again, you can peruse this at your leisure, but this, this captures the conglomerate quality of Anglo, this is all the bits and pieces of it, that it owned and its subsidiaries. Why did that matter? It mattered because it, it meant that business could act together. This is a picture of what uh, economists have, or political economists have referred to as a K-group. So if you, have, if you have a lot of actors who need to do something together, there's a collective action problem, right? How, how do you get them to coordinate uh, and pay the costs of coordinating to provide some good from which they will all benefit? It's a classic collective action problem for which Mansur Olson uh, is famous. So the idea of a K group is, is if there's a subgroup within that group that has the quality that if they can solve their own collective action problems within the subgroup and provide the collective good, it's worth it to them to let everybody else free ride. Uh, the benefits of providing it for them uh, are such that it's worth it to let everybody else free ride. So these big corporate players like Anglo and De Beers and Bala Rand um, and the other major companies uh, formed a K group and, and they could get it, meet in somebody's house and talk about what business was going to do. And that, that made it possible um, first to solve their collective action number, their collective action problem, but it also made it possible for them to intimidate the government. Um, if, you, if you read Adam Tooze, our former colleague, sadly lost to Columbia, his fantastically good economic history of the Third Reich, um, the wages of destruction, uh, 
you know, part of Tooze's story is that when, when German big business started giving Hitler trouble, he threw a couple of people in prison and everybody else fell into line. A bit like the story of, of Putin and Khodorkovsky that I talked to you about earlier. I think it would, it would be too much to say that in the, in the 1980s, South African, South African government were country bumpkins. But they basically, their, their big base of voter support was Afrikaans farmers. They were not um, very involved in the commercial sector. That changed over the course of the 1980s. Um, Afrikaners began moving in significant numbers into the corporate sector. But certainly at the beginning of the 1980s, um, they, they, if they had tried to take over Anglo-American, the government wouldn't have had the first clue to what to do with it. So business was in a strategically strong position vis-a-vis -vis the government, and they could act together. The big players could set the tone and maybe the terms uh, of what was going to happen. And um, they had a double agenda. They wanted, first of all, not to have a civil war or some massive repressive outcome that would be horrific to live in. Um, but they also, so they wanted a transition, and they maybe thought some kind of transition was more or less inevitable. But they also wanted to have a big influence on the ANC. Because the ANC, who were the ANC leaders? After all, they were either living in, had, they were even in prison on Robben Island, uh, Mandela and his friends, or you know, they were scattered around, some in London, some in East Europe. What they knew about economy, economics, they had learned from reading, you know, summaries of Das Kapital and the Communist Manifesto in East European guerrilla training camps. Um, and the, you know, the leaders of South African business knew this. So what they wanted to do was to, you know, they, they like everybody else, were reading The Economist every week and drinking up the, the Washington consensus and all of that, South African business. They wanted the new South Africa to be part of that new story. And so a big part of their agenda was to influence the ANC. So they, this was a dual agenda to, to be, uh, to be handmaidens for a peaceful transition to democracy and to disabuse the ANC of its traditional positions which were about nationalizing the commanding heights of the economy. Um, and so they acted first. In 1985, the head of Anglo-American, Gavin Reilly, just uh, went uh, to Lusaka and met with the leadership of the ANC in exile himself. And the government was furious. They criticized him and they attacked him, but they couldn't stop him. When student groups and church groups and others said, we're going to do it too, they said, we'll throw you in jail if you do that. Uh, but they didn't stop the business groups. And these, this became known as the Lusaka Trek. These business elites started going backwards and forwards uh, to, to Lusaka and to Mozambique and, and eventually um, a whole second set of business leaders started meeting thanks to Cons Gold, Consolidated Gold, in, Gold Company in London with the uh, leadership in exile in London. And so they started having these talks. Um, and they then also decided they had better start talking to the ANC, underground ANC in the country. Um, the ANC was banned but there was a front organization called the United Democratic Front, the UDF, and they started having secret meetings with them in people's living rooms. This is stuff for which you could be thrown in prison without trial for 90 days and then later for 180 days. And what they would do, they would throw you in prison for 90 days or 180 days uh, without trial, and uh, as you were walking out the door, they would throw you in for another 180 days without trial. There were people who were in there for years. Uh, many years under these detention laws. So these people were taking huge risks meeting with the, um, with the leaders of the UDF uh, the, in the mid-1980s. And after a while, the UDF got, you know, irritated with this. They say, well, you know, it's cool to have nice conversations in people's living rooms, but we need an organization to deal with. We need you to form a group. 
And so eventually they did. They formed this group called the Consultative Business Movement in 1988. And what was, what was usually important about this group was that they were the first group of white elites to say, we favor majority rule democracy for South Africa, one person, one vote. Because all the white parties, the government, including the official white opposition, had been talking about power sharing deals, you know, vetoes for minority groups, uh, the educational qualifications for the franchise, you name it. But the CBM was the first group to say, we are for a normal, as ANC had kept calling it, we want a normal democracy in South Africa. And so that, that solved their credibility problem. They didn't say we're, we're neutral about the politics. They said we're committed to a democratic transition and we will um, work to bring it about. And that meant they were the only credible brokers. Uh, church groups were all allied with different political parties. Uh, there was nobody else that could be credible brokers between the government and the, and the ANC. And so, uh, just to give you one, one uh, poignant illustration of how they broke it, um, this is a Sid, Sid, famous Sidney Frankel story. He, he thought it was important that the two chief negotiators, the two, the two deputies of the ANC and the government, should get to know each other. They turned out to be the two chief negotiators, Ramaphosa uh, and South African Deputy uh, President uh, Rolf Mayer. So he, he took them fishing on his trout farm. He arranged for them to be brought in helicopters and so forth. So the story goes, they went fishing and Ramaphosa got a fish hook stuck in his finger. And uh, I, I'm sorry, Mayer got a fish hook stuck in his finger. And Ramaphosa said, I know how to fix that. Bring me some pliers and a bottle of brandy. Um, and they did, and he said, now you drink the brandy, give me the pliers, but you have to trust me. And so the story goes that this was the bonding moment between, uh, you know, who knows whether it's true, but it, it stands for the proposition that the business elites were facilitating the personal interaction between the government and the ANC. Uh, they formed the consultative business movement, as I've said to you, and then once the, the CODESA talks were planned, there was no other group that could be trusted to function as a secretariat for the groups, uh, for the CODESA talks. So, uh, so the, C the CBM became essentially the convener of the roundtable talks between the, among uh, the 19 parties. And when CODESA one collapsed, it was the CBM people who did all the um, running around to get CBM reconstituted the following May, as uh, uh, CODESA reconstituted the following May as CODESA II. And when CODESA II collapsed um, after, after Boipatong and all that, uh, it was they who became the back channel walkers in the woods, so to speak, uh, keeping the conversation going. So a hugely important role that business played in, uh, in convening, the, uh, in convening the, the, the talks and then picking up the pieces when they fell apart. Um, so managing spoilers. I talked earlier about the Kissinger-Carrington um, visit that was also organized at the behest of the CBM. But more importantly, once it fell apart, uh, it was then uh, the, the, the consultative business movement people who decided that they had to act to pick up the pieces. And if you look at the interviews with Colin Coleman in the, in the um, video, Colin Coleman's an interesting man. Uh, he was an architecture student at Witts, University of Witwatersrand, who came of age. He just graduated in the mid-1980s and uh, was the first full-time employee of the CBM. And they hired him 
right out of college uh, to work in facilitating the, the talks with, with the ANC. Uh, today, he's, by the way, is the head of Goldman Sachs for Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, but in those days, he was a, actually he was a member of the ANC, a young ANC member, although he was white, it was unusual. Uh, and so he had a certain amount of street credibility in talking to the ANC. And he, he was the one, after the um, Kissinger people packed up and left, who went racing around uh, trying to figure out uh, what, what would get Butalesi to participate in the election. What would get Encarta to participate? And they basically, they wanted, um, they wanted various guarantees for the Zulu king, Goodwill Zuelintini. They wanted protections uh, for, uh, of property in KwaZulu Natal. They wanted a variety of assurances that they were going to have some say in the politics. And so it was this crisis management and shuttle diplomacy that uh, defused the violence that you saw in the, in the final uh, run up to the election. There were also just massive issues of election mechanics. Um, so one interesting, one interesting tidbit here is because um, the election date was was non-negotiable, it had to occur in April, uh, or the country would have really descended into a complete civil war. Um, the ballots had already been printed when it was clear that Nkata was not going to participate. And um, finally, both virtually Coleman and others had, got, uh, had gotten Nkata to agree to virtually all, uh, gotten the government and the, and, um, and the ANC to agree to virtually all of Encarta's demands, but one of their ones, they said, we've got to push the election back because we haven't been campaigning. Um, you know, and so they wanted to push the election back. And of course, the, both the government and the ANC knew that that was a non-starter. And so uh, finally, they, they were confronted with the problem, uh, again, t tiny things, you know, who, who, the person who said, don't let small things bother you, has never spent a night in a tent with a mosquito. So the problem was that the National Party was on the bottom of the ballot, and they had been campaigning on the slogan, vote the bottom line, vote the bottom line. So that, but the, there was no other place to put a stick-on on the ballots. And these stick-ons had to be printed, uh, and, you know, in record time, and got into all the, this is a developing country, it's not, you know, I mean, I know we have our issues with butterfly ballots and election interfering and all that, but this was a huge logistical operation. So first, the, the National Party had to be convinced that it was so dangerous not to have Encarta on the ballot that they had to, notwithstanding their vote the bottom line slogan on all their literature, that they, they had to, there was no other place for the stick-on had to go there. Then the stick-ons had to be printed, they had to be flown around the country. Business uh, played a role in all of that. And so you get the election result. And the election, as I said to you last time, was widely declared to be free and fair. And um, there's a, there's a wrinkle to that, though, that's always struck me, though I've never seen reporting upon on it, which is that the election results took several days to, you know, finally, you know, often the case, and when you've got paper ballots being counted by hand, uh, it took three or four days to get the final election results. But at the end of the first day, it was declared that, Quasu that Encarta had won KwaZulu Natal uh, Regional Parliament, and that they had an, that they had enough votes for three seats in the cabinet, and so you know I could never prove it, but I have a sneaking suspicion that that part of the election result was negotiated in advance of the election. Um, building civil society support. Again here, um, business worked with church groups and others to put together hundreds and hundreds of meetings 
where they would come and talk about scenarios, they would come and talk about uh, the, the, um, how the economy might unfold in the future, and they would uh, do this as part of uh, their effort to influence the ANC, which, by the way, they succeeded in doing. When the ANC came to power, uh, it still articulated a pretty staunch socialist economic program. Uh, they had a, a manifesto called Reconstruction and, Deve uh, and Development, uh, and it talked about nationalization. Uh, Mandela's first international visit when he came out of prison was to Cuba, heavily criticized by the Americans. Um, yet, but within, you know, within months of coming to power, the ANC had largely repudiated its um, its RDP, Reconstruction and Development Plan, and instead embraced something um, called GEAR, Growth, uh, what it was, Growth in Economic Reconstruction, uh, Growth, I forgot exactly what it stood for, but, but basically it was a shift to the Washington Consensus to a very large extent. Um, uh, it basically put off a massive transformation of the economy, the effects of which I'll talk about uh, briefly in a minute. Um, they created an election fund, they helped with the logistics of the election, uh, and ensured that uh, the elections would be free and fair. So, quite a remarkable story in many ways. Business does not normally behave in this way. Um, and there were, there were, you know, undeniably notable achievements. They, the first is that they avoided the catastrophe. I think that uh, it is a, a fair retrospective judgment that but for the things that business was able to do, both in creating relationships and networks, in, um, in um, serving as, through the consultative business movement, convener of talks, and then picking up the pieces when they repeatedly failed, helping to manage the spoilers and getting them to participate. In all of those ways, there were important achievements. They really did help abolish apartheid in a peaceful way, ended the country's pariah status, and had a lot to do with the resurgence of the economy. This was the era when people were talking about the BRIC countries, right? Brazil, India, China, uh, Br Brazil, Russia, India, and China, they started talking about the BRICS because South Africa had a big economic resurgence. If you look at sort of macroeconomic and social indicators, um, in, the, in the first 12 years or so, uh, the number of people living in poverty went down not in a non-trivial way, and they did create an uh, a black middle class between 1995 and 2009, half a billion rand was, and that was when the rand was worth a lot more than it is today, uh, was transferred from the white business to black business. So in, in, in all of these respects, you could say there was a significant achievement. And business uh, deserves considerable credit, some of these business leaders, for uh, taking big risks and being willing uh, to do uh, what they did. But on the other side of the ledger, there are pretty challenging legacies of the way things unfolded. Um, we still have a limited uh, democracy, single party dominant democracy, uh, as I talked about last week. Uh, those tend to be very corrupt. Doesn't, South Africa is not special in this. Go to Russia, go to Mexico, go to um, India for a long time, single party dominant system, very, very high levels of corruption come with single party dominant systems. The politically entrenched labor movement has been very costly for the country over time uh, because it protects, and this is, this is the South African variant of the story we're talking about in Germany uh, and in, in the advanced uh, capitalist countries earlier in the course. We have, um, a very high wage economy in the formal sector, but we have huge unemployment. We have 30% um, 30, 30 unemployment and 
almost 50% youth unemployment, one of the highest youth unemployment rates in the world. South Africa hemorrhages textile jobs to Lesotho, even to China. Um, so you have uh, the downstream effects of this, um, of this very powerful, entrenched, uh, organized labor movement uh, that's wired into the government. And by the way, uh, that all exploded in uh, 2012 at a, at a platinum mine in a, uh, in a place called Maricana, where again, ironically in view of the 1970s, wildcat strikes were organized against the unions and existing managements for sweetheart deals that they believed were excluding them. And about 34, I think it was, uh, people were shot dead by the police, many in the back, huge blot on Cyril Ramaphosa's uh, um, character because uh, it made it much harder for him to win the ANC leadership in 2018 because he was one of the directors of Americana Mine. Um, since the transition, business is completely disengaged. Uh, while they were very proactive at this time of crisis, it's much harder to get people's attention for a chronic problem than for a crisis. And after the transition, South Africa's problems went back from being crisis to chronic. The inequality, the poverty, uh, the lack of racial integration except for uh, elites. And so if you look, this is a, so a Lorenz curve, which a Lorenz curve is a, just another way of depicting a Gini, the Gini coefficient measure of inequality. You can see the, um, the, the the dotted line is uh, 2009, the blue line is 1996. You know, so in the first decade and a half after apartheid, the overall structure of inequality in the economy uh, has not changed. And, and a decade later, it would be much different. This was, um, this was in the Wall Street Journal, uh, what for now, four years ago now, but these numbers uh, wouldn't look sub substantially different today. On the left-hand column there, you can see, uh, again, Gini coefficients. You can see South Africa is one of the most unequal countries, even decades after the end of apartheid, um, in the world. It's actually got the highest Gini coefficient of countries for which we have data. Um, that doesn't mean the highest in the world. I suspect if we had data for places like Saudi Arabia, it might have a higher Gini coefficient. But in any event, it's basically 0.7, uh, enormously unequal, even more unequal than you can see there than countries like Colombia, Brazil, and Mexico. Um, so unemployment, I already told you the story, but you break unemployment down by race, and you can see that um, you know, a third of the black population uh, is unemployed. Half of the... Um, um, Half of the black youth unemployment is, uh, population is, is unemployed. If you look at other social indicators, if you look at people living in poverty, um, half the black population is still living in poverty. Uh, adults with high school only education. Uh, again, you've got, you know, 15% of that black population has a high school education. Um, Private health insurance and the public health insurance is not very good. 10% of the black population. Indoor plumbing. Uh, you know, we're living in, in the richest country in Africa in, uh, you know, this is in 2014, but you, it's not much different today. A third of the black population does not have indoor plumbing. Uh, and so, you know, this is, this is one way of... Uh, saying that good things don't all go together. Uh, so they avoided a civil war. Uh, the outcome really would have been ca catastrophic. I think very few historians would dispute the proposition that hundreds of thousands, probably millions of people would have been killed, uh, and it would have gone on for a long time, and it's not clear at all what would have come out of the other end of it. But we are in a world in which um, you know, there's very substantial disillusionment as politics now normalizes and the revolutionary generation passes from the scene. 
and we uh, face the run-of-the-mill uh, problems that many uh, developing countries face. Uh, Cyril Ramaphosa, you saw him as a young man in that very first video that I showed when he was the leader of the National Union of Mine Workers and then Kasatu, finally the chief negotiator for the ANC, and uh, he was worried when uh, in that video talking about being shot at. You know, he is a, his story is a very interesting uh, depiction of the interaction between business and politics in South Africa over time. He begins as an ANC activist. He then becomes the head of the National Union of Mine Workers in Kasatu, eventually the Secretary General of Kasatu and Chief Negotiator for the ANC. Uh, he was edged out of the succession to Mandela by Mbeki um, when he was the heir apparent, so he decided to go off and get rich. He became South Africa's first black billionaire, um, hugely successful. Then he came back into politics as Zuma's deputy and in a very bitter fight, um, finally won the, uh, won the leadership of the ANC, but it's a, he, it's a, it's a, would be a, another entire lecture to go through uh, the slenderness of his grip on the ANC, which is partly a result of the way in which it's governed, um, but that will be a topic for later in the course. Next, we will be talking about the ICC and the, the doctrine of responsibility to protect.